welcome back to the Dante's Divine Comedy Podcast. Uh, and welcome everybody else now for we have our favorite guest back here on our show, Thomas Todeska. So welcome, Thomas. <laughs> Hello, Richard. Hello, everyone. Very glad to be here. Mm. So we're now going to follow up some of the topics we had in our first talk together. Uh, and also, first of all, congratulations with finishing all of the videos for the purgatory. Yay! It was really, really nice. Also for everybody listening. So we, uh, the last episode came out like last night or this morning, and it wrapped up the whole of Purgatory. And it was a really beautiful uh, way of presenting the Canto, and also to see how both, like how the first and the second book are a unity together, and how it's the final preparation, and Dante is fully ready to then ascend into the stars. So what we wanted to do in this episode is to look at Inferno 26 and Paradiso 1. So this is partly, as we mentioned in the first talk we had, about um, the story of Ulysses and how this is very important to understand, uh, both w the role this has in the Eighth Circle of Inferno, but also how this is one of the most crucial ideas and themes of the whole comedy, and also how this is a very practical a practical insight and psychological insight into how to think and how to, to approach the world and understanding and existence and all the biggest question as well. So we then going to just read quickly from the story. So this is in the eighth Bolgia of Circle 8, where Dante is seeing the, the souls who had the sin of intellectual pride, intellectual superbia. So we're now just going to read a little bit of the of the verses here and then we're going to have the <laughs> then we want to hear Tommaso's thoughts about what they mean so wonderful mm, good <clears throat> so Ulysses then or Odysseus he then says the, he talks for 52 lines but he opens with when I set sail from Chirke who more than a year had kept me occupied close to Jaeta not sweetness of a son, not reverence for an aging father, not the debt of love I owed Penelope to make her happy, could quench deep in my myself the burning wish to know the world and have experience of all man's vices, of all human worth. So this is the setup, this is the intention of Ulysses, like what he wants to do, and it's stronger than all these other things. So he then sets out uh, on the deep and open sea, and he sails through the Mediterranean, through Gibraltar, when they reach the narrow neck, and they keep going west, west, west. And then, brothers, I said, who through a hundred thousand perils have made your way to reach the west during this so brief vigil of our senses, uh, and that, consider where you come from. You are Greeks. You were not born to live like mindless brutes, but to follow paths of excellence and knowledge. So then he just repeats this theme. And they keep going, and he says, like beautiful poetry here, we made our oars, our wings for that mad flight, gaining distance, always sailing to the left. And five times we saw the splendor of the moon grow full. And then comes the ending. There appeared a mountain shape, darkened by distance, that arose to endless heights. I had never seen another mountain like it. Our celebrations soon turned into grief. From the new land there rose a whirling wind that beat against the forepart of the ship and whirled us round three times in churning waters. The fourth blast raised the stern up high and sent the bow down deep as pleased another's will. And then the sea was closed again above us. So that's the end of the little story of Ulysses. So... Tommaso, tell us, <laughs> how, do you, how do you read this? What is the symbolism? There is a, a beautiful commentary, um, especially on this last part that you read, which is so magnificent, by Borges, Luis Borges. Mm -hmm. um, he, like many people know, he was in love with the Divine Comedy. And uh, in many conferences, when he was invited to talk in public, etc., he went back to Dante and the Divine Comedy and how much he loved it. And uh, specifically about uh, Ulysses, he said uh, that it was his belief, Borges' belief, 
that uh, Ulysses, that canto, and especially this part that you read, uh, sounds uh, even more intense and even more emotional and even more personal than other cantos of the Divine Comedy because Dante uh, uses Ulysses as his own alter ego, as somebody who is basically the mirror, the mirror image of Dante, or at least one Dante, one possible Dante. And uh, so, you know, in, in his opinion, uh, Ulysses is really uh, a part of Dante that Dante recognizes, but he wants to grow out of or grow from. And uh, we understand, to go to your original point, only by the end of Purgatorio, more precisely what this part is. Mm. Yeah, that's a very, really good point. It has... He hints at this in the beginning when he says that he stands on the bridge, he looks down on this valley with the glowing lights. It's, it looks very beautiful, very seductive. And he says there he's on the bridge leaning far over so far that if I had not grabbed some jet of rock, I could easily have fallen to the bottom. Ah, so, yes. Yeah, that's so right. I, I mean, you have it in so many places where Dante is uh, referring to his own intellectual pride or the temptation of his own intellectual like his main vice is is the this the <laughs> his inclination towards the intellectual pride so um yeah and it's yeah. Uh, um you know if uh, a reader reads uh, inferno 26 we only get this concept of intellectual pride of uh, feeling superior etc well, but we don't really understand because he never mentions mm. what exactly he's talking about what he's referring to in, in his own life um and that's a little bit of a mystery, but you know, many scholars by now realize and recognize that Dante, uh, you know, as somebody who was a poet, if we think about how his career started, mm -hmm. his career started one day when he joined, um, let's say, a public uh, uh, competition. It was a, comp a tournament of poetry and uh, he wrote a little poem. He published it, meaning that he actually sh sent it to, mailed it to a lot of poets and people in Florence. Mm. And one of the people who really, maybe the, the person who really loved his poem the most was Guido Cavalcanti. So Dante, as a boy, he was maybe 16 or something, 17. He was invited to Guido Cavalcanti's house. And they had a, an, an incredible chemistry. They really loved each other as friends. They loved to talk to each other about many different things. And Dante had a big influence. And a, a huge part of this influence was philosophical and theological. And Guido Cavalcanti could be seen as, uh, an, uh, from the Christian point of view, as a negative influence for Dante, because Dante, through Guido's Averroism and Epicure, Epicureanism, etc., he saw the, those theories as so attractive that he started to embrace them. That, that's mm. what happened. Hmm. That's very interesting. You also have, if in the Vita Nuova, you have uh, some of those, some of the poetry is the same, like the sending out to friends and getting, like this communication between the, the different writers at the time. Um, yeah, that's, that is, like you see how deep it goes uh, I also like it's <laughs> going to hold a couple of points here back till we get to Paradiso one here, but um, there is something that you see in his twenties as well. He sees this this that is drawn between the the profane philosophy and the more theology of Beatrice. It's he's toiling with this in his twenties as well, so it's kind of it's um it's a mature topic for him. And it's I think you have a great point. Like it's a this canto is um is very evasive or kind of hard to grasp. If you yes. read it, like it's, it's almost impossible to understand what this means or how. Yes, almost how, on purpose, almost purposely yeah. vague. Yes, almost and like, yeah, and how, but how enormous this is in terms of the whole, <laughs> whole comedy. Uh, there's also a very, um, like all these layers in in Dante's writing, but I've seen some commentators saying that Dante. Uh, clearly didn't know Homer and 
<laughs> and Greek because this story is not a part of Homer. So some people completely misses the point with this, but it points to uh, an interesting thing that this is about intellectual pride. And what Dante is doing is he's, as a writer, he takes Homer and reinvents a story <laughs> with Ulysses as the main person, which is pride. Is, is, that in itself is pride. So he's showing <laughs> what you're yes. not supposed to do through inventing this story, kind of shamelessly <laughs> ornamenting and kind of improving a little bit on Homer, which is then what you're not supposed to do. So, Yeah, I mean, especially um, I, I, if the fact that Dante had was born with such an incredible intellect, uh, you know, a, a level of uh, intelligence that was probably higher than anybody else that mm. he knew. Mm. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Um, is something that we always constantly need to remember when when we try to interpret Dante. You know, because we need to imagine somebody growing up in an environment where he was constantly the smartest guy in the room, mm. the most intelligent guy around. So how is that, um, you know, not conducive to pride? How is that not conducive to feeling superior, to feeling like you can do whatever you want because everybody is lower than, than you? It must have been so difficult and uh, he must have been facing such uh, struggles in order to curb this uh, pride mm -hmm. and understand that uh, there was something else beyond worshipping his own ego yeah. you know it's a great point and it's in some ways is how he shows his humility by admitting the strength of pride or kind of the temptation of pride in him so it's <laughs> because he points to this directly then also when they get to the first terrace that this is my my strongest vice but he knows it but he's, he still does it a little bit and that's probably his personal challenge to to kind of balance this right you can you can see it a little bit in um, um this is vulgari eloquentia when he talks about kind of getting the the uh, vernacular and creating the Ita i mean he created the italian language himself like as a one person so yeah but when he he has a few passages where he makes examples of different types of poetry and then how some of his friends would phrase it and you see that he can he can emulate all of them without as, any as, problem. <laughs> yeah, as if he he is them. So he, he kind of completely goes into them and, and yeah, and maybe even improves it a little bit. So just think about uh, think you know think about Mozart. Mozart yeah. uh, also had this. Uh, he was known for having this ability to emulate uh, famous mu musicians and musical artists. Mm. And uh, I don't know about Mozart's personality, but it's. Uh, almost uh, certain that somebody who was who had grown up with this type of intelligence and genius uh, felt above everybody else and had an immense uh, sense of pride. Uh, we have some anecdotes about Mozart's life where he was very, he was actually somebody who was arrogant, etc. But how, how can you swerve from becoming a very arrogant man mm -hmm. if you are born with that type of gift from, from your birth, right? Yeah, I guess it's difficult. Is, I guess this is why Dante is seems so happy in uh, limbo with uh, with the, the yeah, classical ancient <laughs> philosopher and poets because then he feels at level with them. Kind of he finds his companionship in kind of the greatest it is writers. Level. Yeah, exactly. And but I, I suppose well, it it seems like Virgil then is one of those that he actually admires. Maybe he can see him as as someone at his level or maybe above on some some areas i'm not sure but it's like it, it seems genuine his admiration for for virgil yeah so yeah and so you know you get to this point where um you are you meaning dante reflect yourself in somebody like ulysses who is a leader who is so great that who can they can defy god hmm. the highest imaginable entity on earth and defy meaning challenge but also understand he can understand everything if we go back to the convivio right the convivio was almost like uh, when it always makes me think of when google was created when google was created it, the the engineers who thought about it, the two founders larry page and the other one thought how, how can we download the internet 
Mm. That's the main question they started from. How can we download mm. the internet? And the Convideo was not too different because the Convideo was how can I download all the possible knowledge yeah. into one single book or encyclopedia, which was not a, a new idea because, as you know, Brunetto Latini had done it. I mean, Aristotle had done it. So many people before yeah. had tried to, to do, the, do this. And, uh, and he was one of, the, one of them. He felt like he had the intelligence to, which he did. How, how, so he's looking down from this uh, bridge hmm. and he's feeling like he's almost falling down into the ditch because the, he knows that the risk is so high to fall into that sin and to remain there in eternity, for eternity. Exactly. It's a, it's a nice image with um, like downloading everything. Like, as you say, he, that's what he does in the comedy. I, I remember having these astonishments again and again, and starting with this, like uh, discovering it many, many years ago that it encapsulates every, like the totality of everything in his culture and in history and human experience and philosophy. I was just stunned by the ambition of the work so many times, like the first years working with it. Um, yeah. So, but I also love another thing with the Convivio because he set out to write 14 books, I think, 14, 15 books, and he stops after four. And, yeah. and you have these discussions why that happened. And uh, in, in my uh, impression reading through it is that what you, what you see there is both that he, again, emulates Aristotle 100%. Some, some of, the, of the passages, it's, you can you couldn't sit, tell that is not Aristotle. I think even like I an Aristotle agree. expert would say this is authentic Aristotle. So he yeah. what he learns through writing Convivio is that he can do Aristotle one hundred percent, like for pages and with the thinking. But then he also starts with so the first is just prose, and then the three next ones have a poem in the beginning. But the poem in the beginning grows for each of those three. And the sense you might get from it is like he gets closer and closer to exactly the ah, poem and yeah. the voice of the comedy. Because the last one, that it's about the same length. It's the same, like he gets, he's almost there with the rhythm and then suddenly it clicks. Ah, it's like an, it's like an opera singer. You know, they, they get their voice, like the voice isn't finished before you're 40, around 40 yes, years. Yes, yes. And then suddenly the voice is fully matured and grown out and then, from there on, you can sing with this enormous voice. This so, is such a great, uh, <laughs> such a fantastic metaphor, actually. I never thought about it. In, uh, but in I, I got goosebumps when I was reading the last page because like, here it is. You can, this, he found his voice here, which he, yeah. which he said when he was in his late 20s, that I will work for many years now to be able to do, to write this enormous poem about yeah. Beatrice, symbolically. It almost, uh, it almost sprung from, from him, right? It's, the Divine Comedy almost sprung naturally from what yes. he was doing, from his work. And, and when Beautiful. that happened, I thought, like, you can see, that's when he just stops uh, the Convivio project. So now, and then he starts writing Inferno afterwards. Uh, yeah. And you can also see it's a bit fun, like, in the, <laughs> in the, you have commentary in those Convivio books, but, like, on the last one, he gets more and more annoyed, kind of with himself, like, for anyone read the book so far, this must be obvious that it means this and that. He starts getting a little <laughs> bit passive aggressive in his commentary. And that's <laughs> also a sign that the project is finished, I think. So, um, yeah, it's incredible because um, he's a man who definitely went through a lot of growth, not only changes, but uh, uh, positive changes in his uh, personality and in his, let's say, psychology as he grew older and uh, because he kept writing constantly we can track all those changes in in his writing and uh, i've always thought that uh, as magnificent as the inferno is um, it never reaches the sophistication and the wisdom the wisdom of the purgatorio and uh, and of course paradiso um, yes they are all one integral unity and it's one work but i think you know even just the four or five years of distance from one to the other you can feel them yep. a little bit i, I noticed this this when kind of going through these two cantos like inferno 26 paradiso one i had the same feeling early today 
suddenly you can see the contrast. Like the, I think the, well, when do you think he gets the full voice? Like when is he really like, is it the beginning of purgatory or is it gradually still? You know what? It might be actually around the Canto 26 of Inferno, to be honest with you. That's mm. my impression because, uh, because what follows is, uh, um, you know, uh, um, a, a poet at the peak of his uh, strength and abilities, uh, there would not be uh, Canto 33 or, Can or yeah. Conte Pugolino without all of his powers at 100%, I don't think. While if you go back, uh, Canto 5 is fantastic, but Canto 5 is a little bit of a rough diamond. It's yeah. uh, a mishmash of things. And it doesn't have that consistency, that cohesion that a Canto 33 has. I'm, I'm speaking as somebody who oh, yeah. is absolutely not an expert. I'm not a specialist. It's just my pure sense and opinion. You, you have the Italian heart here too. <laughs> and intuition. <laughs> uh, pure intuition. But, but it's... it's um... I, I really love that because he, there's something, there is something happening in, if you read through the Inferno that it's so uh, kind of down in the cave, it's dark, it's claustrophobic, it's just uh, rocks and horribleness, like chapter after chapter after chapter. But this story suddenly kind of lifts you out into the open and you're sailing around in the Mediterranean and you have like the heavens and it's a, it's a really contrast right. to it. I've seen it sometimes it's kind of foreshadowing of the purgatory in this, or it reminds us that we're going to get out of this. It's a little, yes. it's a relief. That's that little uh, kind of, it's a bit, it's yes. not a flowery story, but it's a bit like flourishing open. Um, yeah. Because before that we haven't even had an image of purgatory, but now we have at least an image yes. of it. So I think yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, I mean, he started yeah. looking forward. He started looking forward yep. to it. And this is something you see also everywhere that he plants little seeds uh, and evokes. So now we have a little image of this mountain and then a few chapters later, we're going to meet it. Then he comes out of it. So it's a, yes. it's a, it's a marvelous, uh, <laughs> it's a marvelous control he has sometimes when, like when of, of the whole substance of what he's writing. See, uh, it, you, you said it right. I mean, sometimes even when you, even when you are talking about something, let's say you are discussing about one particular canto, okay? We are normal human beings, so we can focus on the canto, and maybe we have a few notions that we have from all the other cantos because we already read the Divine Comedy a couple of times, okay? We have to imagine um, uh, being inside the brain where all the, all, you have to multiply this by a thousand. Yeah. So it's it's not that you only have a couple of notions, a few notions here and there about all the other cantos. You have everything. You have mm -hmm. everything at your disposal, just like a computer. So it's a matter of memory at the end of the day. It's a matter of an incredible mnemonic capacity that uh, you can feel in the writing because it, sometimes you you are like, it's impossible that somebody without an incredibly strong memory could write something like that. Because the integration of elements is too much. It's too much. There is. Maybe you mentioned something about this in one of your videos about that he might have had a condition with like people who can't forget anything, like all memories are stored forever. And if you combine that with kind of this sparkling intellect that continuously uh, organizes everything, then you end up with something, like in his case, something that where everything fits. <laughs> yes. So it's, yeah, um, I'm, I, I realize that it might sound uh, uh, almost exaggerated, but you know, read the Divine Comedy if you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we have the proof right there. The integrations are are so many and so subtle, like you say, they, they are so sophisticated that unless for every tercet he stopped and prepared it for at least three or six months, yeah. then he couldn't have done it unless he had this type of memory. And uh, uh, absolutely he had it. I mean, it, it's really, really fascinating to think of what type of, how his brain worked and what kind of, because we are talking about some type of dysfunction, of course. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a dysfunction, meaning that in modern terminology, something that, you know, 
is not very nice to live with, you know. Yeah. But he had it, and uh, uh, even just you know seeing a girl that you like, and then running home and having a vision of somebody eating a heart. That's not normal. That's you know mm. you have some problem. I'm sorry, mm. but uh, but that's exactly what he experienced, and and uh, he wrote about it. I don't I don't think it's a complete coincidence that. Um, some other literary geniuses like Dostoevsky had epilepsy. A lot mm. of commentators and scholars are talking about epilepsy as one of the potential diagnoses of, for Dante. Mm. Yeah, I you made me think of some a quote here that um, one of my favorite quotes is this is from the <laughs> end of Paradise in Paradise 33, but it's something that comes back to me as as. Uh, as a metaphor for the comedy in itself, which is when he have he has this big uh, big final vision and looks into the divine light. But then he says, "Yet as I learned to see more, and the power of vision grew in me, that single aspect as I changed seemed to me to change itself." Oh, so this, this kind of reiteration of like. Which you discover, like you might experience when you read the comment, like you you learn more and then you see the comment comment differently, and you discover more things, and it changes you, and then you see more things. It is reciprocal, kind of. It keeps going after years and years. Now it's still, you, you see things hidden in just small tercets. That yeah, and you, uh, and you uh, and you, start, you grow the wings. I thought this today. Suddenly, mm. that's what he says. He talks about growing wings all the time. That's what you do when you read the comedy. Yeah. Yeah, I can. I have a okay. The only vision that I had personally, <laughs> I didn't have any vision of uh, hearts being eaten. Mm -hmm. The only vision that I have when I think of Dante is Dante going into uh, a 2021 bookstore with a, a fire thrower, a flamethrower, mm. and burning all the books <laughs> about uh, self help. <laughs> because self, because you should really take all the self help books and burn them down, destroy them, throw it because. Once you read the Divine Comedy, you realize there is nothing else that can better guide you, Christian or not, religious or not, mm. on a path of personal growth. Nothing. That is a fantastic vision to have. <laughs> I, I've, I have thought this, well, I'm, I'm hesitant to call the comedy a self-help book for exactly those reasons. That is a genre that is full of kind of... Uh, what should you call it? It's it's like <laughs> it's a very commercialized uh, branch of the book yeah. business where you just make money out of yeah, know, selling quick quick tips that, that don't yeah. work long term. But what you might say with Dante is that it is the long term. It is kind of the, I had a really nice conversation this week with the, one of the people I work with, and then about like some things in life might take a decade. So he's uh, he's just on thirty, and we and I, we talked about some things, and it's like. He, there was something he wanted to achieve, and I said, it might take you a decade. It will be a decade of investments to get there. This, this is the <laughs> part of the reality that it's, you can't fix it in two months. It's like you, you need to really work for it long, but then you will get the rewards, and then, yeah, then you can reap the yeah. rewards, the fruits. But it's some processes in life are longer, and then, so in that sense, you could call Dante like this is a long-term project for you know, changing yourself. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love this point because it reminds me of uh, um, your actually your previous podcast when you were talking about uh, movement, the concept of mm. movement in the Divine Comedy. Uh, because, you know, uh, time is so fundamental in Purgatorio and uh, the concept that uh, you cannot achieve anything unless you invest time. Mm. Uh, slow, you know, kind of day-to-day -day, um, and patience, patience meaning terrestrial patience, and this is, again, why personally I resonate most with Purgatorio as a cantica, because Inferno and Paradiso, in their own ways, they are... You know, I think the professor said it really well when he was talking about the, the constant movement of Paradiso, mm. which is a, a, an eternal movement, yes, but it's not a movement in, or in, in the sense of going from A to B, mm. right? Yeah, it's 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 more like a, 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 a condition of being. Yeah. 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 He had he was fantastic to talk with Dr. Phil Carey. Yes. Um, there is um, 
there is a disciples there about um, it's a kind of enigma with the, with the heavens and where this described that they are timeless. They're not changing, but they're still active. Like the f- spiritual forces, like the angelical beings, are active, but they're not changing. So, but it's still there is movement, even if it's not that. But it's a big topic for another day. And just for listeners, the the image with the burning heart as being eaten is from. The um, La Vita Nova, he describes this specifically, that he gets this vision after one of the meetings with Beatrice, I believe, when he comes home. Yes. And then yes. he has this kind of uh, ecstatic, uh, delirious um, vision of I mean, of her, um, or, you know, a, a kind of a divinity to... figure feeding yeah, her a heart. Exactly. Is uh, Dante saw himself as a prophet. Yes. So when he thought about uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the biblical prophets, he didn't think of uh, of them like a modern psychologist could think of, you know, because a modern psychologist, you tell them about visions, the first thing they think of is, oh, mental issues, okay? Mm. But no, this is a very modern and probably wrong way to look at this type of experiences. Um, Dante looked at it as simply a communication with a higher dimension mm-hmm. and with the divine and from the divine. And that's what uh, happened to him quite often. This is only one of the experiences that he had, right? Yeah. It's always nice to invoke uh, Hesiod in, in this, when he, he writes about the muses. He, he calls on the muses like 800 BC. Uh, so it's like almost 3,000 years ago when he writes the Theogony. It opens with this calling on the muses and then they come and they say to him, uh, we will tell you many false things as though they were true. But when we want to, we will tell you the real deep truths. And this is a way of looking at the visions yes. as well. Like they, they might, it's like dreams. Some of them are really profound. They can come from deep places within you, in your psyche, in your archetypes, in your structure of your psyche that can tell you things. And sometimes it's just complete nonsense. So you, you have to. You have to <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly. And that's okay. Or that's how it is. So you, you shouldn't dismiss all of it and you shouldn't try to interpret all of them either but just being open that some of them might be um, might yeah, be telling you something day, very profound um, at the end of the day that's how prayer works um mm. not only in christianity but i think i'm pretty sure in uh, islam as well prayer and meditation work in along the same lines of uh, it's not like every single thing you you feel and hear in your prayer uh, it means that it's the voice of the divine. Mm. That's that's not what they teach you. I mean, uh, the correct uh, or maybe let's say mature way to look at it is just like you said to be able to discern, mm. you know, within those experiences what is actually a glimpse of truth, a glimpse of the divine, and what is simply not. There mm. is there is this difference, right? And this is why spiritual. Um, traveling and growth needs some type of guidance and a director because if you're by yourself and you try to do this work you get lost very quickly exactly so it seems like there are parts of psychology and science that are increasingly acknowledging that intuition and imagination might have roots down to something that is kind of also scientifically biologically in you so it's not again the same point that it's not always random there could be but it's it's um it's it's a bit back to the art of life sometimes, like to understand it, and then you might use some more um, less strict scientific methods to to discern these things also sometimes. But just keeping a little bit open mind, that's 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 back to the humility idea of the purgatory. Just don't be kind of uh, too assertive about everything. Just keep a little bit open that maybe there is something. So yeah, um, yeah so um, and all of these are great points to move on. Uh, on to Paradiso 1. I just have one last thing from Inferno 26 because we spent a bit of time on the history of Florence in the 12 and 1300s, which is on this podcast, a few earlier episodes, which uh, describes the times of Dante. And if you read about this, and especially like the Black Guelphs and then uh, Corso Donati, then the opening of Inferno 26 is a bit fun. This is a tercet when he says, be joyful, Florence, since you are so great that your outstretched wings beat over land and sea, and your name is spread throughout the realm of hell. <laughs> <laughs> you just feel it's that. It's actually, 
Yeah, Dante. this is actually literally Dante being bitchy. <laughs> yes, this is he, he, and probably he just he's letting it out. It's like it's okay. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's a bit too much, but this is this is how he sees it. It's a uh, it's a powerful image there as well. Um, okay, and I really like that we, we touched on like the idea of psychology a couple of times because it's um, well, sometimes people think psychology is invented with Freud or uh, last couple of centuries, but there's so much deep psychology in Dante, and then I think what we're going to talk about now might might kind of draw a little bit from that. So if you then move from this idea of intellectual superbia, intellectual pride, thinking that you can you can capture the whole entirety of the world and knowledge through rationality and reason only, which is what Ulysses does. And then when he moves to something that is a bit beyond the mystery, the spiritual, which is symbolized with the mountain, the storm comes and pulls him down and, and kills him or and blocks him, if you want to use another word. And this is in a way to say that this is he himself who is blocking the, the possibility to move beyond it. It's a it's an automatic, mechanic uh, part of, of your own choices. So now we're going to move to take a big jump to somewhere which is far beyond from where Ulysses ever came. And then that's the end of Purgatory, which you had in the last video, and then the beginning of Paradiso. So, but maybe have you started reading Paradiso 1 now? Will you prepared it? Have you any thoughts of, or maybe you can just say something about the contrast in overall? Like, how do we move here from? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, <clears throat> I can give you my two cents on that because um, yes, I've read Paradiso so far uh, in my life four times, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, now I'm a little apprehensive, thinking that you know uh, it's okay maybe for somebody who's just a, a passionate uh, fan to talk about Inferno. It's okay for a passionate fan to talk about Purgatorio, but Paradiso. Let's <laughs> we'll see what happens. You know because. Uh, I know that, and Dante knew knew it as well. Um, Franco Nembrini, in his uh, new Paradiso book, in his introduction, mm -hmm. he actually notes this by saying, in Inferno, at the very beginning, Dante, in, in his invocation to the muses, only spends one tercet, mm. one, one terzina. Yep. In, uh, for Purgatorio, he spends two of them, two tercets, when he invokes them, please, you know, let me be a poet good enough to talk about Purgatorio. And in Paradiso, he spends eight of yeah. them because he's aware of, and he goes straight to Apollo, who yeah. is kind of the emperor of all the muses. So, you know, he's aware that the task that is, is the most ambitious of all. And from a spiritual standpoint, we could almost say that he's already done all the work because uh, purgatorio is where you do the work but it would be incorrect to say that Dante in Paradiso 1 is already let's say it is already arrived to his uh, uh, point of utmost growth or perfection because Beatrice keeps telling him that his intellect is not sufficient he doesn't understand things he, she talks about his brain as encrusted in some dark material meaning that throughout Paradiso, he will still have to do to better understand and clarify his, his sight. Like you say, his eyesight. Uh, and, and Paradiso is all about sight. It's all about seeing mm. better, looking at truth in a way that you can better understand it, better see it. So obviously yeah. from my point of view, I, I will do whatever I can to um, get into the the but to think about this another this other immense cantica uh, that talks about uh, things so ethereal and uh, maybe for the first time such a huge work in poetry uh, is, is basically theology in poetry mm -hmm. you know, that's you know is saint thomas and saint augustine in verses mm -hmm. um if you don't if you haven't digested all of the Summa Theologica and all of the, the Civitati Dei St. Augustine, there's no way you can fully, fully understand Paradiso. And I haven't. I haven't mm. read all the Summa. I haven't read all the Civitati Dei. So obviously I, I will uh, try. Um, but, but I really believe that Paradiso comes from Dante having processed 
and digested all of these great fathers of the church and great theologians. Yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful point that you made about the beginning, like eight tercets. It's, it seems to me that it's both genuine, that it, or he's both showing us how to be humble and, and have humility through fully just uh, admitting that he needs help from both the peaks of Parnassus, both Apollo and the Muses. Um, so like the several layers that he shows that the pilgrim has become purified and full of humility and ready. And then also then maybe he himself really feels that this is the challenge. Maybe he feels that starting this third book, maybe like Inferno, maybe he more had the, the whole structure when he started. And then when he comes to Paradiso, that he sits there by his desk and thinks this is going to be really Oh, yeah. He was like, oh, crap. <laughs> yes. Maybe he, he thought maybe it's not going to work even. Like maybe it's... Yeah. Um, so this, so this opening is so full of... There's so many tercets here that are, are full, full of wisdom. Um, it's just... So I, I keep thinking now that this is... This is fully now showing what Ulysses is missing. Like we're now so completely into this enormous world of wisdom and beauty that that Ulysses could never get to. So kind of now Dante is also showing us that 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 like what it is. And uh, there's a there's one little um, famous quotation here, which is uh, like a proverb almost, like uh, from one small spark can come a mighty blaze. Um, that's a famous uh, little saying. Uh, it's also fun because this is, <laughs> uh, he's showing his humility again because he says here then right after the verse after. So after me, perhaps a better voice may rise in prayer and win Sura's response, meaning Apollo. So he's even here hinting that maybe sometime in the future to all listeners, all young poets, especially out there, he's saying one, in some place in a century later, there will someone who <laughs> will pick it up and write something even bigger than the comedy, maybe. At least that's what he's suggesting. And uh, I feel pretty confident in saying that that person hasn't born yet, or maybe the person has born, but, uh, you know, th th we haven't uh, seen their work yet. Yep. Um, I, I cannot but, think of anyone who has done this seven, the last 700 years. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, there is a... <clears throat> it's... A, you're right. I think there is a, a sort of humility there. He's not starting off saying, I am the greatest, I'm writing the greatest thing, and that's it. He's actually conscious of his role in history, almost mm -hmm. like feeling the weight of the centuries that will come in his future, because we are his future, and, uh, say, and admitting that it's possible that somebody will uh, even go beyond. But uh, according to many people, Nobody has even gotten close to his level. So <laughs> going beyond Dante, it's uh, quite a challenge, I think. But it might be something like uh, some of the Greek basic philosophy, logic philosophy has been laid out once and for all. And some of the math has been written down and laid out by some mathematicians forever. So you don't have to... I mean, it goes into this argument that we keep going back to on this podcast of that, that the, the thinking was that also wisdom and spiritual wisdom... Um, would often be structures that are eternal and timeless and everyone will come to the same, will discover the same structures and patterns. So that's why if you do discover this and, and put it in, into poem and you kind of be precise, then you have done the work. So it's not, I'm not sure if how Dante well, thought about that, but yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> There's also a way to, you know, I think this is also a way to maybe try and make this uh, conversation more let's say practical and factual for our day and day-to-day -day life because um, just think of uh, the concept of history that a lot of people have today in our in our world west east uh, there is almost a mainstream uh, way to think about history uh, in a actually very pessimistic way if you think about it you know um, at best, as something that just keeps rolling and rolling without any type of meaning or sense, like a washing machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and very often with uh, a lot of alarmism 
as uh, you know, I don't want to even bring children in this world because this world is so uh, horrible, etc. While uh, from Dante's point of view, it's the opposite. Mm. Uh, history is going in a certain direction. It's uh, the well, is the revealed truth. Therefore, is the Christian view of of, la- of history. However, the fact that the Christian view of, of uh, history is positive and optimistic doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, only abstract and ethereal. Mm. There, might, there could be in the future uh, some visible movements and measurable movements in history that is still too soon to see. For example, the fact that as a collective society, we are in fact growing only at the macroscopic level, at a level that is very difficult to perceive and understand when we just read the news, for example. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it's uh, this is a way to apply the teachings of the Divine Comedy to our worldview, in a sense, and uh, and make it because you can maybe casually make a comment about history not having any meaning, and we just rolling around or maybe even the future being lost Uh, but that is very very unhealthy and very hurtful deeply in our soul when we say that Hmm. you know and yet we hear so many people say it our friends uh, people on the news on the media right yeah yeah it's um it's interesting how Dante has like the optimism and the positivity even if he but he lived in kind of mixed times like his personal life was not uh, it was not the most fortunate in in the way he was thrown out of Florence and kind of drawn into the political strifes and was in exile but still and and also just want to add in that point that it's not uh, people sometimes think that it's his personal grief of not being in his city but it's as much like the the, the bigger forces with the French king, the German emperor, the the pope, the papacy who occupied t- Tuscany and took Florence. So it's 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 more it's bigger movements such as his his own his own wish to be back in Florence. This, this is big like a bit on the side here, but um, but it's still an, an immense uh, optimism and positivity in the way he's writing, with also now the paradise. Um, so I um, one of the terses I found here that that links back to Ulysses again is also when. Beatrice tells him that before he he can ask his question, Beatrice says to him, you have yourself to blame for burdening your mind with misconceptions that prevent from seeing clearly what you might have seen. That's one of the more direct uh, (laughs) charges she has towards him. She's, Uh, yes. Not very poetic there. Very (laughs) straight descriptive in, um, and, it just reminded me back to like uh, this is Ulysses that kind of he he has misconceptions and then he doesn't come further than than uh, we can't move into the, the more spiritual and uh, spiritual wisdom. Um, it's also just this thing with this, the patterns and, and discovering eternal wisdom and patterns. Um, this is partly uh, what when they say over and over that they can read his mind and his thoughts. I always think of this as that is an that's a consequence of that. It's predictable what he's going to think, what he's going to, how he's going to react. They can also like they can see it in the heavens because it is, it's just predictable. He he will, he will uh, fumble around in in the new landscape, a bit in the darkness at first, but then he will get to know it, and and then he will discover the same thing. But he will also have the same questions. So, yeah, it, to me that makes sense actually. The way that. The Dante makes Paradiso work in this way that uh, he's the only one who doesn't know everything because he's, he's the only mortal one in Paradiso. Everybody else can read his mind, they understand his questions before he asks them, especially Beatrice. Yeah. I think it makes sense, you know, in this uh, um, meaning of what we were saying before of Paradiso being this uh, eternal place that even if it keeps moving, mm. it still have has a certain frozenness about it. Like it's eternal; it's mm. there forever, and uh, eternal joy, eternal love, 
eternal light, but eternal, meaning there is no evolution. There is no evolution. Mm. So um, you can see the pilgrim is, he is a bit like the student. So in that sense, you might, uh, you might see it briefly as the paradiso being the wisdom and then the pilgrim is the learning process, which is then also why he keeps asking. But it's also, when I read it the first few times, I was struck by how much he is encouraged to learn. Like this is me then coming from like completely secular background <laughs> and then learning about theology and being a little bit surprised that they, that he is so encouraged for rational inquiry and discernment, like all the way into the whole of the paradise. So, um, but now well, I know it's natural, but I didn't know that before. Yeah, well, um, I'm glad you say that because uh, this sense of, uh, of uh, spiritual inquiry, religious inquiry being very friendly with uh, rationality mm. uh, goes against uh, what our culture teaches us from when we are born. Unfortunately, mm. because it's wrong. It's mm. a cultural mistake that our today secular culture makes to say on one side there is religion and on the other there is rationality. And they are two, th two separate things. It's uh, funny how in a nutshell, oversimplifying, this is actually what Averroism was saying as well. Mm. What the, the vain thoughts and the fake intellectual ideas of Dante were actually saying, and he fell into that. Yeah. Um, you know, is, well, he is wrote it? the Divine Comedy to, to demonstrate the falsity of that. But we also need to remember, I hear a lot of people when they read the Divine Comedy say, oh, such a creativity. To be completely honest, Dante didn't really create anything. Mm -hmm. He was a great uh, um, combiner and mixer of things. But, uh, you know, I would say that St. Thomas Aquinas is the real creative power mm -hmm. behind Paradiso. Mm -hmm. It's not Dante. That's Dante good. is a great poet. Mm -hmm. the, the, the real creative genius is St. Thomas and also St. Augustine. Yeah. In, and maybe uh, St. Bonaventure also. And some kind of adventure. I mean, it's not only only them who I have the sense were the first ones to do that intellectual work of that was needed at those times because because there was already some powerful intellectual work being done going in a wrong direct in an incorrect direction mm. uh, to uh, take philosophy that in those times was Aristotle and uh, uh, combine it and really. Marry, marry it together with uh, Christianity and Christian doctrine. Yeah, I guess you could say what Dante does is he he organ he he does or but <laughs> there had been done parts of it before, but the way he's organizing everything is something that he's doing, uh, and he's expressing it in poetry. That's kind of that is part of his creative Absolutely. genius comes through how he articulates it in in this beautiful, powerful poetry that that actually moves you and it kind of changes you when you read it. So, yes. But he's very yes. honest that he's not inventing, like the structure of Inferno is very much uh, Aristotelian and Paradiso, uh, Purgatory, sorry, is, is the, the, the capital sins of, of, of Catholicism. And he elevates like Aquinas and Bonaventure as the two strongest theologians in the sun. So he's not... He's not hiding his uh, his influences. <laughs> yeah, no, you, I think you said it better. That's that's the the proper way to look at it. The creativity is there, but it's a it's a poet creativity. So exactly. where Dante is really really creative is with the words, with the language. Mm. That's his genius. The content, it would be a mistake to say that he made it up because he took all of that content, ideas, theories, and and philosophies. And, from somebody else and in Paradiso, especially from St. Thomas. Yeah. And you might say to be a bit poetic that he he gives it a spirit. <laughs> that is, there's a spirit in the comedy that is Dante's own personality, soul and yes. spirit. Yeah. Which is also kind of, which, which is like this fire almost that, that, uh, 
that makes it so wonderful. <laughs> um, so we're going to try to keep this like an hour. So we have like five, six minutes left. Uh, and then, but we have to keep talking about this <laughs> in, an, in the next episode together. <laughs> of course. Uh, but I, just one main point I really want to kind of get through here at the end is that, so the whole, uh, let's read for the, there's a terse, another terse here in the first chapter, which is, the providence that regulates the whole becomes forever with its radiance, the heaven wherein revolves the swiftest sphere. For me, I'm going to unpack this now, but for me, that could almost have been the opening of Paradiso. Well, this is Dante's claim to what is the big picture for everything. When you're thinking or understanding reality, your psychology at the deepest level, and also to understand existence, spiritual and material existence, that the swiftest sphere is the primo mobile, and inside of the swiftest sphere, you have all the spheres on the earth in the middle. So it's the material cosmos. Mm -hmm. So it's just putting it here that the heaven wherein revolves the material cosmos. That's the main frame. That's the big picture for how to apprehend anything. That's the base thought for existence. Not that you have a material and spiritual world that are connected or, yeah. that you, or do you just have the material rational world and the rest is just something else. It is embedded within this timeless eternal heaven. And there's also something about brain psychology that this is actually a very healthy, balanced way of looking at the world that you, that you, uh, yeah, you embed the material within this that within which is is could be the key just to say like what is what is the, the big mystery <laughs> and the divine like that within which the material spins and in my view that's that's Dante's whole point when it comes to <laughs> how to think what's the big picture yeah so, you have any thoughts well I mean it's uh, obviously uh, a challenging point here because um, we get from this we get straight through the entire Cantica and then up to Canto 33, the last Canto of Paradiso. And uh, good luck really understanding through that final vision, right? Which is, like you say, I completely agree. It's kind of the nutshell explanation of everything, you know, of, of everything, uh, based, basically. But uh, I cannot say that I. I feel like I properly understand it myself. You know, I, I have a certain um, intuition, like I, like I like I said before. It's uh, um, especially when it comes to the one of the greatest uh, mysteries within Christian doctrine is the mystery of the Trinity, the the idea of the Trinity, and uh, I feel like uh, having lived as a Christian for uh, my almost my whole life, uh, I didn't understand it for most of my own life. And I maybe cannot completely say that I understand it yet, but only recently I properly looked into the meaning of the Trinity and uh, a theologian explained it uh, as uh, in a way that uh, made a lot of sense to me and that I believe Dante fully understood probably or no likelihood better than I do mm -hmm. as uh, the uh, entire engine of existence yeah. that love is not something that is static there needs to be a loved one as well which is Jesus and then there needs to be the act of loving in between which mm -hmm. is the Holy Spirit so the lover the loved and the act of loving, mm. constantly moving in an eternal way. Um, is, is this something that you can teach a young kid, you know, when they <laughs> teach you Christianity? Obviously not, because it takes a while, but uh, the more you reflect upon life and what life is for you, what, what it means, you know, being here, the more you understand this is pretty much the fundamental thing of everything. Mm. Some of that, there's something about just having more years of experience that you again, you, you see things start to stand out differently. The longer you live, the more some things keep being kind of the, or many things fall off, but some things 
become become more and more clear for you. And it's it's a bit of a especially, joy. Yeah. yeah, especially if you're willing to do a little bit of work. Because yeah. if you're not, you can remain a teenager until you're 85 with no problems. And we know many of them. Mm. It's uh it's interesting to see that many people when they are around 30, um the 20s aren't working anymore, but then they don't know what to do. <laughs> like they yes. don't know how to think or where to start uh, learning more things. And uh, and the good news there is that suddenly you can connect with ancient and medieval writers and thinkers that you thought were just dusty and irrelevant. And suddenly they start sparkling to you as much more relevant and full of wisdom than most of the things you see today. You suddenly just, just, uh... they are the ones, yeah. You just, you basically told the story of my life right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it, I think it happens to yeah, most people, especially those who do then do take a second look at things and start, yeah. Uh, yeah for with with, be, with humility again, it requires a bit of humility. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> the, the point of purgatory is not only theoretical and abstract uh, the, when it comes to putting in the effort without effort there is no growth mm. if you want to mature to become an adult right you need to be willing to put in work yeah. and uh, uh, you know it, it needs to be interior work it needs to be focused work um, but nevertheless work and uh, if you don't if you're lazy if you find uh, you know if you're if maybe Sometimes to have troubles is a real blessing because they force you towards making work. Uh, if you if don't have these troubles and life just gives you a lot of pleasures, you get everything you want just uh, by flicking your fingers, mm -hmm. then you stay a little boy until you're 70. You know, 70, uh, yeah. you just, it's too late. But probably not so happy. There will be a weird form of existence and being many like that's complete. many i've talked with like express that that it's just something yes. missing but they don't know what it is and they don't know where to look so then Absolutely. you're stuck <laughs> so uh, yes. yeah um yeah so hope that can be also be like a bit of inspiration for people to, <laughs> to just like i hope it uh, makes a little sense yeah yeah and i guess at least for both of us like dante is, is one of those uh, those uh, uh, sources or inspirations that really can can uh, make you rediscover life again fully and see so much well, more. And it integrates you know, all I remember the old the first, into it. Uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> I remember the first time we talked, you and I talked about Dante, and uh, I really, really stand by this. I believe it. It's, it's impossible to talk fully and seriously about Dante without uh, um, investing a part of you and uh, kind of going under the underwater, in a sense. Yeah. feeling that you've had a uh, um, more than engaging conversation but a personal a personal conversation mm -hmm. if you if you come out of a conversation about dante and you don't feel that it means that you're missing something that that's my belief yeah and there will be some small uncomfortable things as well <laughs> that's absolutely but but you get the support and the prediction of it through dante like dante is telling you as he's doing it that you will feel mm -hmm. resistance and you will you might want to try to avoid some of these things because it's a little bit uncomfortable but it's very helpful there's a nice thing with purgatory just remind me now that um some of the souls say that, that when they understand what they get out of it they actually want to do the penance for <laughs> for for 500 years <laughs> metaphorically <right? laughs> uh, because they um they, they don't see it as hard work that they, they dread but they know that it's, it's a, this is about positive thinking. They see it not as hard work. They see it as the key or the mechanism that gives them something good. And there, yes. through that, it becomes something uh, joyful. I mean, it's not joyful. It becomes at least something you, you're happy to do. It's, it, it, I would almost uh, define this as the science of happiness. Mm. You know, how to be happy. Uh, it's very much about uh, realigning your desires. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than what you're doing, you know, uh, a superficial way to look at it would be uh, I'm forced to do something horrible and therefore, you know, I just have to start liking what I'm doing and then I'm going to be happy. 
that's really not what, what Dante is saying. There is, uh, and this is why, you know, any religion, but Christian doctrine in particular, can only work if there is such a thing as objective truth. Mm. If there is no such a thing as objective truth, is this world is a full sea of relativity, mm. you can never align yourself with anything. Yeah, While if you if there is objective truth, you can align yourself with something that leads you to happiness. And it's fairly clearly outlined and, and you can, you know, you can follow it. Uh, otherwise, it's like, I think Bishop Baron made a, a fantastic, it wasn't his simile, but I love this simile of a river that has banks and modernity likes the idea of the river without banks because any type of rules or, or discipline or limitation is bad, is seen as negative. But without the banks, the river has no impetus. It doesn't have any, any strength or energy anymore. And it just, mm. you know, sw it becomes a swamp. Yeah. That's a very nice picture. And I, um, yes, that's a really good point. It, it also, it goes back for me to this, this thought that this is why the divine comedy can be so uh, just a source of stability. It can be so st stabilizing for you. Oh yeah, seven hundred years old, but it has it's just so firm, founded, and a kind of <laughs> rock mountain of stable stable knowledge that you can that it can be a kind of a, a base or just like a footing for yourself. And it's uh, not because you choose it, but it's almost like it chooses you. Once you understand it, it becomes. You will see it, I think. Um, okay, so I thought we we're gonna wrap it up now with a little bit of an hour, um, so uh, we could go on for an hour easily. I think. Um, as I just, always. For, yeah, and it's it's just but this is the beauty of Dante as well. When you start talking about these topics with Dante, it just opens up more and more and more new thoughts and ideas. So that's that's the beauty of it. That's how it should, it's supposed to work as well, I think. And maybe that's how it works in our psyche when we read it and deliberate it. So. Um, just want to at the end there's uh, mentioned then the opening of of the Paradiso, which is then the glory of the one who moves all things, penetrates all of the universe, reflecting in one part more and in another less. It's kind of this overall picture of the whole, like the the glory, the divine glory comes in like everywhere, but then more in some parts and and than in other parts. And then the final sentence is also really beautiful because there's so much packed into this canto, and then it ends with this simple sentence that Beatrice is then, as he says, then she turned her gaze up toward the heavens. And that's kind of just leading our focus up towards the goal where we are going, the process, the, the paradise is a process of just rising upwards. Yeah, and it's, a, it's also an expression of joy. It's also an expression of, mm. of the fact that she is happy. Yeah. So um, that was all um i have planned at least for to talk about inferno 26 but it is the one the psychology how to think and the contrast and where this leads us um if you have any thoughts at the end or any plugs at the final, final moments no <laughs> thanks again you know this is the this is a great conversation That's really <laughs> true. <laughs> and um um well, so I have a plug for, for you. I mean, uh, I think everybody should, now is the perfect time to kind of jump into this conversation, this journey, because then the next video will be the beginning of Paradiso. So then it's, it's a great place. You, have, you get so many nice comments as well, which is beautiful to see. And um, uh, also uh, I would like to make a plug for my previous episode with uh, Dr. Phil Carey. That was really interesting. Getting a, he's a Dante expert. Uh, from like the uh, <laughs> Ivy League professor, Yale University, and he is also uh, has worked with Dante for so long. So that was uh, uh, full of uh, kind of points that we keep referencing and and working on. So, um, uh, but most of all, just for people then uh, uh, to go to Tom's channel and then watch his beautiful videos and see where this goes. And it's going to be a creative journey, I think, from here. Absolutely, yeah. If uh, if you want to see somebody messing around with uh, around the divine comedy, that's the perfect uh, channel to come and uh, have some fun. Exactly. So uh, with that, just thanks everybody, and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>